there's a rhythm about Morse code, rather like music, and the straight key certainly puts you to the test. So let's do some straight talking about the straight key. Hello and welcome once again to the Waters and Stanton video channel. Now I imagine you're wondering what has a hedgehog got to do with Morse code? Well, <laughs> the answer is nothing actually. When I was taking the photographs of these two Morse keys, I used a hedgehog, a toy hedgehog, which my granddaughters play with. I put it in the picture as a joke really. Um, but they insisted that I use the hedgehog in the title page. So I've used the hedgehog. There is no other connection. And yes, and yes, of course, you can think of a connection. Now, I've been trying to think of a connection between a hedgehog and Morse code. I think of spikes, prickly things, but I really cannot think of any connection. If you can come up with a strap line, let me know. Well, the Morse key is nothing more than a switch really, it's a means of switching the transmitter on and off or at least the signal on and off and this key here is the key that I first used when I was first licensed back in 1960 and uh, it's not a bad key actually, it's, a, it's an ex-military key, I've, I've no idea of the history of it but uh, like I think most of us, we started in those days, it was very easy to pick up a, a military key. Uh, quite nicely made, actually. Uh, it feels quite nice, although it's um, quite dusty and quite old, as you can see here. Now, this interesting thing about these keys that we were using in those days is that we didn't have any side, what we called side tone. Very often we were sending signals without actually hearing what we were sending. Now that sounds strange, but actually if you know what you're sending, if you know whether you're sending a dash or a dot, then you send it and you just imagine what it sounds like. It sounds a bit crude really, but basically you were able to send Morse code without side tone. Now side tone was a bit of a luxury because in the early days you didn't have side tone. I mean, you could. I suppose you could monitor your transmitter, but the, 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 tran the transmitter and receiver switching was very crude. Um, so generally speaking, when you were sending signals on Morse code, the receiver was silent and all you got was these sort of key clicks, which is a sort of a, they were familiar in those days, you know, the old key clicks. So no means of monitoring it, no side tone at all. In a previous video, I didn't mention about Morse code and the origin of it, and uh, it was actually the, the idea was invented by Samuel Morse, but the actual code wasn't. Um, old Samuel Morse thought that uh, what you'd have was a, uh, a, a number of dots and dashes that would indicate a word, and each word would have its own little code. But I think. Uh, one of his staff members pointed out that there's quite a few thousand words in the dictionary and maybe it's better to have a code for letters because there's only 26 letters in the sort of Western alphabet and it's far better and far easier to remember 26 different characters or different codes than it is to, to, to remember three or four thousand different words. And I think Samuel Moore thought, oh yeah, he's, he's got a point there. He has got a point there. I think the idea of starting with a straight, what we call a straight key, it's a manual key, straight key, is not a bad idea because it gives you the ability to practice sending. And if you've never used a paddle key before, then it can be a little bit confusing, particularly if it's what we call an iambic one, and that's, that's a completely different subject. So if you're starting Morse, then a straight key is a good um, way to start. Now, the, there are two basic adjustments on a Morse key. I'm gonna show you here 
Um, if I can find it, I'll just go and get the um, the Japanese key that we sell a lot of, which is a really nice key actually. So let me just get one and uh, I'll put it on the table here. Right, I'm back again and I found the horse key. This is made by a firm in Japan called High Mound. And this is the HK705, which is by far and away the most popular um, manual or straight key that we sell. Uh, it's, it's, it's nicely made, but it's not overly expensive. And I'll show you a close-up here. You can put it on the desk and you can see a close-up of it on the desk here. And basically it's two terminals and on the end of the cable that you connect to it, you have a 3.5 millimeter mono jack. Now I should mention that most transceivers um, are designed to accept either a straight key, which is two terminals and which uh, would therefore have a mono 3.5 millimeter connection normally, um, or an iambic key, which has got a stereo three terminal connection. Almost certainly you need to go into the um, menu system uh, on the transceiver to tell it whether it's a straight key or whether it's a uh, paddle key and it will then automatically switch the connection so that a mono plug will work if you've got uh, a straight key or a stereo plug will work if you've got an iambic key. There are two basic adjustments on a straight key. One is the distance of travel, in other words, how far you have to press the key before it makes contact. And the other one is a spring adjustment, which adjusts the amount of pressure you need on that key to make the contact. Now, the correct adjustment is the adjustment that feels right for you and every person that um, uses a straight key after time will have their own personal uh, preference. Some like a, a reasonable amount of pressure, uh, a spring action on it, others like a very small amount of, uh, of movement and very little resistance so that they can send CW at the speed they want to. Now when we're talking about speed, um, I found that you can send, or I can send CW at a speed of around about 20 words a minute with a manual key. Any faster than that, and I just can't do it. I haven't got enough movement. And also, it can be quite tiring. I think most people that use a straight key probably send at between 15 words and uh, 20 words a minute. And at that sort of speed, it's quite, it's quite comfortable. One thing that you do notice with a straight key is the operator's sense of rhythm and sometimes a sense of lack of rhythm. <laughs> now, a dash is reckoned to be three dots. So a uh, um, three dots would be a dash. So did 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 da. So three dots followed by a dash, which happens to be V. The dash is the same length as those three dots. And interestingly enough, um, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony starts off with da 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 da, which is a V in Morse code and which was used during the Second World War um, as a sort of a, a thing the BBC transmitted. It was sort of V for victory. So Beethoven's Fifth Symphony starts off with a bit of Morse code. Now maybe that's something you didn't know. And in, uh, if we go back to the early days of phones, we had the SMS text. SMS text. Did it it da da did it it. Do you remember that? Did it it da da did it it. The SMS tone, which was quite popular when mobile phones first came out. So you've got the M, which is two dashes. You've got the S, which is three dots. You've got the V, the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And most people know SOS. Did it, da, 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 did it, it. So you've got the letter O. So if you're learning Morse code, you know some of those letters already. 
Now, if we go back to the rhythm, it is really essential that you follow the rhythm because if you don't get the correct rhythm, your Morse code becomes quite difficult to read. You have to have a very small gap between letters and a more noticeable gap between words. Otherwise, the recipient, the person listening to the Morse code, doesn't know whether you've got to the end of a word or not. So look at, when you're learning Morse code, get the rhythm. Three dots is a dash. Da -da -da -da. Um, oh, no, another one, um, letter Q. Um, I always think of Here Comes a Bride. Q is da, da, di, da, 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 di, da. Here comes the bride. So the letter Q, and you learn the rhythm, and it's the rhythm which you need to learn. And you need to maintain that rhythm when you're sending. I've, I mean, you still hear it occasionally. You hear some CW and you think, do you know, I'm really having trouble knowing what that guy's sending. Not because he's sending fast, but because he's blurring the, he's blurring the digits, he's blurring the letters. There's no gap. And one of the uh, things that you hear quite frequently, actually, is there's no gap between words. And if there's no gap between words, you think, wait a minute, where are we? So when you are learning Morse code, make sure that you leave that just that small gap between words and the, poor, the, the gap between um, letters almost happens naturally anyway. So it's, it's, the, it's the gap between the words which is more important and also maintaining that rhythm. Da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da, letter V. And the letter B, which is the reverse of that, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. If you're into music, those three dots, like a triplet, da -da -da -da, da -da -da -da. So what should you look for when you're buying a Morse key? Well, you know, you can spend an awful lot of money on a Morse key and you can spend quite a small amount of money on a Morse key. Um, I would say that if you buy um, a Morse key that is being made in America, being made in Japan, being made in Germany, being made in Italy, probably it's going to be quite good. But steer clear of the very cheap keys. I would, I would think that you need to spend around about 40 or 50 pounds on a straight key to get a key that is quite reasonable. Now, the problem is that it's rather like buying a pair of shoes. You, you, you really don't want to buy a pair of shoes unless you, unless you try them on. So the best thing I can say is because you can't try, try the Morse key, generally speaking, go for a, a model that is popular. Um, the high mound models are very popular. Um, there's some Italian ones and so forth. Um, provided you spend 40 or 50 pounds, you're not going to buy a, um, a key that is no good. After you've been using Morse for some while, then what you will find is that you, you know what you're missing and you may want to perhaps, um, when we're open again, go to the nearest ham radio shop or go to a rally and try the keys out because there is no doubt about it that there is a feel to a key but it, you can't quantify it. It's, it's a sort of a personal thing. I have never spent a lot of money on a Morse key. On a straight key, I use the HK705 and it's, it's fine for me. Um, I, it does everything I want, but there are those that would want to spend a couple of hundred pounds on a Morse key and it's fine. I mean, it's, you know, you, you spend a lot of money on a Rolex watch or you spend on this particular watch, which cost me £10.95. Um, it tells me the same time as the Rolex does, but um, people that buy Rolex watches would probably spend all afternoon convincing me why I should have a Rolex rather, rather than the 1095 watch. There we are. You pay your money, you take your choice. But I would say um, spend 40 or 50 pounds on a, on a straight key and you won't be disappointed. So if you're a newcomer to Morse, and this is a golden opportunity at the moment with this lockdown and so forth, it's a golden opportunity to, to, to learn Morse code. If you're learning Morse code, I would say 
um, certainly practice sending on a straight key because it will give you practice of appreciating the rhythm. Uh, it's not going to cost you a lot of money. And once uh, you've got to, you, 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 you're, you're competent in sending Morse code, you can use that same key to plug into your transceiver. Now, when you're practicing, most transceivers will, um, you can use for practicing your CW. All you do is turn the power down to absolute minimum, put a dummy load in the back, and just uh, send Morse code and practice it. Some transceivers have actually got a, uh, a, a tutorial um, uh, position in the menu, but you can certainly just turn the power down, put a dummy load in, and practice sending CW. However, my advice, uh, if you're starting out on Morse code, is don't worry about sending, first of all. Just learn the code. Learn the code, and it will take a little time, but there's only 26 letters in the alphabet, and we've already covered S, and we've covered O, and we've covered V, and we've covered Q. Um, and we covered M in S uh, M S S M S. Um, actually, I got that around the wrong way, didn't I? It's S M S. Did it da da did it it. Yeah, I got that around the wrong way. Apologies there. The reason I say that you need to concentrate on learning the code is when you are learning Morse code and when you're sending Morse code it's not too difficult to actually send it because you know what you're going to send. If you're going to send, um, I don't know, hello, you know you're going to send an H, which is going to be followed by an E, which is going to be followed by two L's, and it's going to be followed by an O. Your brain knows that before you start it. The problem with receiving uh, Morse code is that you don't know what you're going to receive until that letter has been sent. And whilst your brain is... is, is um, understanding that or decoding that, the next letter's been sent. So you need to be able to get up to a speed where you can copy Morse code at a certain speed. And you'll only get up to that speed once you grasp it. If you're In the early stages, you practice sending it, it's really not going to get you very far. What you need to do is to be listening to Morse code because the brain doesn't know what the letter is until it's been sent, and whilst the brain is working out what the letter is that's just been sent, the next letter's been sent. So it's got to be sort of fairly quick, but it's fluid, it's fluid. And you start to, it's rather like a language actually, um, you start to recognise the, the word, you recognise the sound, and you don't have to count the dashes and dots. So when you're starting out, I would say the emphasis has got to be on copying Morse code. Sending Morse code is quite simple, really. It's not too difficult, apart from the rhythm, as I mentioned. But sending Morse code is not difficult. It's receiving it, which is the most difficult uh, thing, and that's the thing you need to master. Morse keys come in all shapes and sizes. In my fist there, I've got a Morse key. Really, I've got a Morse key. This is the little tiny Vibraplex, little tiny straight key, which it's one of the smallest keys I've come across. It's great for um, portable operation because it takes up no room at all. It's very nicely engineered. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to cover these two keys in close up so you can see the keys, see the adjustment, and uh, you can then be in a position to um, uh, consider what you need to buy and how to set your key up. We'll have a look at the HK705. This control here is the control that you adjust so that you adjust the height that the key travels, in other words, the gap between the contacts. And uh, if I unscrew it a bit, you can see there's a lot more movement there. That would be far too much for me. And then the other adjustment there, that's the spring adjustment, that adjusts the tension and it's very much a personal adjustment. So the two main adjustments on the key and on most straight keys is the tension there, the amount of uh, pressure you need to put on the key to push it down, and the distance, which um, this setting is far too high for me, but again, it's a personal preference. 
Now I've turned the HK705 round and you can see the connections there for the cable. Um, there's no positive or negative, either side will do. I've used shielded cable, but you can use ordinary uh, twin flex if you so wish, it doesn't really make any difference. And now we come to this little tiny Vibroplex mini key, which you see by the size of my hand how small it is. But nevertheless it's a straight key and it has the same adjustments. The first adjustment there adjusts the travel, and the other adjustment there towards the uh, left adjusts the feel. In other words, the, 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 there's a spring there, and it adjusts the amount of uh, pressure needed to push the key down. I've got this fairly finely adjusted. You can see, you just about see the movement there. Um, in fact, that's a bit too much. I would um, throttle that back a bit. but. Um, you can adjust it out like any other key, and then um, at the back here or side, we can see that. Let's turn it around that way. Um, there are two terminals there which you attach the uh, cable to, and you need to put little um, uh, solder terminals on the end of the cable. You can undo those top screws, slip the cable over, and then just tighten the screws back onto the cable. And it's all very neat, but uh, very tiny. But uh, great fun and great for um, portable operation. Now is there a uh, correct way of holding a Morse key? Well, I think there is, or let's put it another way, it's the way that I prefer, and it's, it proves to be less tiring. You see a lot of operators like that, with their uh, wrist off the table, which is fine, but you'll find that very quickly your, st your arm starts to ache. I prefer to put my wrist on the table like that. I hope you can see that. And the action is it's a wrist action, but your wrist is on the table all the time. So you haven't got the ar your arm hanging in the air and it's less fatiguing. Like that, it works, but you've got enough, the whole arm is moving up and down and you're supporting the weight of your arm and it starts to become tiring. So I tend to operate with my wrist on the table, on the desk, and it's just a small amount of movement there, and you can adjust the key, of course, to the movement you like, but that's the way I send it. So, that's straight Morse keys. There's a whole range of them, as I said, and you can spend anything from £20 up to probably two or £300. And certainly the most expensive ones have got nice mechanisms, rather like the Rolex watch that I mentioned. But you don't need to spend that sort of money on a straight key. So, as I frequently say, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been useful, I hope it's been entertaining. No, perhaps it's not entertaining, I, I don't know. Anyway, hopefully it's been informative, and if you're a newcomer to uh, Ham Radio, I hope it's given you um, a bit of information about straight keys. And in the meantime, oh, you might remember, you might think of a, a connection between a hedgehog and a Morse key. I still can't think of a connection anyway. There we are. In the meantime, enjoy your hobby, because that's what it's all about. Take care, keep safe, and speak soon.